Good morning. Good morning to all of you and welcome to the sixth Arian meeting. This is the first one that we are having online. So it's the first one of this kind. And I'm very, very much excited to see that many of you have registered. We have around 120 colleagues uh, across Europe who uh, have expressed interest to join this morning. And I see the numbers are going up in the chat. Uh, we are almost 80 online. Happy to see you there. This is uh, Burana, project manager at the IRMA for Ethics and Research Integrity. And um, I would like now to hand over to Nick, who is IRMA's managing director, and he's also very much looking forward to welcoming you. Yes, very much looking forward indeed. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, indeed, very happy to see you join because I remember 8 March 2018 when we had the first uh, meeting of this group. Um, after a long uh, period of, of trying to set it up because we saw the need for the community um, to have such a group. Um, on H March, we were happy to be um, hosted by the European Co Commission and by Mr. Karatsas, who is also speaking today. So we've come a long way from there. And this is, as Barana said, the sixth meeting, now almost, um, I think, two and a half, three years um, into setting this up. Because of the COVID situation, the sixth one is online, but I think this is also an opportunity very much to be more inclusive, to be able to do more um, newer things. So let's take uh, advantage of that. We also have more people than in most of the meetings that we that we had before. So it's quite a progression. Um, and also within IARMA, the attention for ethics and research and integrity has grown quite a bit. We have meanwhile engaged in um, the SOPs for RI project, uh, for example, uh, we uh, have now a very nice document uh, coming out of uh, the group that I think um, will be discussed today or, or at least um, um, after that on, on training in um, ethics and integrity. So very much looking forward to having two very good speakers today. Um, I think it, it will be interesting and then the breakouts after that. Just saying where the community has come from and where it's going is also on the structural side. So on how we try to engage online, we have now been looking and I have promised it a couple of times in the past, I think, um, at a system to have more membership engagement. We are now on the Synapse uh, platform, which is the platform of, of the commission, but we will be transitioning at some point in 2021 into our own, our own system, which we have now been looking at for uh, about a year on what the, the good system would be to do this. So I don't want to take you too long on this uh, early morning and get into the interesting stuff. I hope you have a wonderful uh, session and do um, uh, join those breakout sessions for everybody who registered after uh, the, the session which we are presenting. So I hand over the word to Borana again and um, enjoy. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I would like now to share my screen to show uh, a few slides regarding uh, Arian activities. So I hope that will go smooth. I think here you are. So that has been a journey uh, since the first meeting launched in 2018, uh, March 2018. And uh, we have been going through uh, six meetings uh, twice per year. At the beginning, identifying top priorities and looking at what was needed uh, in your uh, fields. And then we have also been looking at specific topics in different uh, meetings in the last years. We also had two webinars in June. And you can see here uh, that these are available on the IRMA website and you can find more information in there. Now, uh, yeah. this is a piece that I am very excited to present to you today. Uh, we are uh, happy that uh, we can launch uh, a report from the last Arian meeting uh, in Eindhoven where um, Four authors have been working since, uh, and, uh, and hardly you see the names in here, Stephanie, Yona, Seva, and Karim, whom I would like uh, to thank very much. And um, this report, it's available online on the IRMA website, and it's um, a guidance document for ethics and integrity training. It's a document that you can use as a reference when you think about building your own trainings and thinking about the ideal uh, program. It's a living document, so uh, of course uh, updates in the future can, can be foreseen. 
uh, but it is now there and uh, for you and for the community. It is uh, a bit early, but I would like to anticipate that the next Arion meeting is foreseen in March 2021, and um, it will happen online. We will be in touch in the next uh, weeks and months about the topic and the exact date, but I care to say to you today that, uh, yeah, we will have surely the opportunity to meet together in the next meeting in March. And lastly, before we go into the deep talks of today, um, it's about the format, uh, shortly to show you that we have uh, two morning talks uh, from two amazing speakers. I think I do not even need to uh, mention their names. Uh, they are very well known to all of you. We will start the morning with the talk of Lex Bauter uh, and the session will be moderated by uh, Stephanie. Ghent University, and then uh, after a short break, we will have Dorian Caracas from the European Commission, and this session will be moderated by Jonas, uh, Stockholm University. Each of them, it's a 50-minute session, and we are also taking uh, questions and answers during them, them uh, throughout the, the talks. Um, for those of you who have registered for the discussion tables, uh, we will then have a break and uh, we will go into this part uh, and will end roughly at uh, 1 p.m. As you have seen, you, there is a chat at, at the bottom of the bar where you can interact with uh, the other participants. But for questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A and this, uh, then the questions will be handed over uh, directly to them. Now I would like to uh, hand over to Stephanie who is the moderator of next session. Stephanie is a research ethics and integrity uh, advisor at Ghent University, and she is also Arian co-chair. Stephanie, this is for you now. Thank you, uh, Borana. Good morning to all of you, and a warm welcome from my side as well to this uh, online Arian uh, event. Uh, I think this is, with a head start, the largest online event with the Arian community. Uh, we've had so far, so uh, this might have something to do with the key speakers we present to you uh, today. Um, I'm very proud to present the first uh, speaker. Uh, I think it's clear from his uh, professional biography, uh, you've seen that in the invitation uh, for today, that our next speaker has a richly filled career as a professor, as former rector of his university, Vrij Universiteit Amsterdam, and as a teacher, and researcher on all aspects of research integrity. His leading role in strengthening the research community uh, to the worldwide network it is today has been uh, crucial. What I bet you don't know is that during his studies, he also worked as a truck driver and uh, as a professional sailor. Um, and although he doesn't drive trucks uh, anymore, he still loves uh, to sail at sea. Today, he will guide us through the fierce waves of research assessment in its role as a perverse incentive for research misconduct or on the opposite, as a tool to stimulate uh, research integrity and the crucial role of the Hong Kong principles in all of this. I give the floor to no other than Lex Bouter. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, thank you for this kind introduction. And, and I'm so glad that you kept all the secrets. Uh, that's really good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. I, I, I feel really privileged to be able to introduce with you the Hong Kong principles and I'll try to share my screen as a first test whether I'm up to serving you on, on the web as well. Uh, here it is. Uh, the story is about the Hong Kong principles for assessing researchers with a view to foster research integrity. And, and maybe let me start with the main message, the core message, and I'll repeat it at the end, of course. The main message is that we should reward responsible research practices and not reward perverse incentives uh, when we assess researchers. And, and that mainly boils down to the fact that we should stop being so, so, uh, well, centered on bi biometric indicators. 
these biometric indicators, there's nothing wrong with them in, in itself. It's, it's okay to count citations. It's okay to count uh, uh, publications. It's also okay to, to, to look at the derivatives like the impact factors or the uh, Hirsch index, but it's completely wrong uh, when this is the only thing you do because then you send a message that these are the two only things that matter in academia and in research in general. And that is not true, of course. Uh, it, and in itself, it can become a perverse incentive because you can game them. It's not that difficult to get a lot of publications. It's not that difficult to get a lot of citations. And when you focus only on that, you might be uh, ignoring the m much more important things in, in, in research. So, so th th that is what my story is all about. And the background is the wide criticism we have seen in the last few years on uh, exaggeration of metrics in, in academia and the assessment of institutes, of universities, of research groups, and yes, in researchers as such as individuals. Uh, on the left, you see the, the metric tide. It's, it's, it's still a, a really relevant report from the UK, the Leiden Manifesto and the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment basically say the same. Um, DORA has uh, gained much more traction. Uh, many people are subscribing and organizations as well to DORA. And the basic thing is, let's face it, uh, it, it is countable and, and it's nice to count publications and citations, but let's not fool ourselves that these are really good quality measures. Uh, now on, on, on the background of that, um, let, let's dwell a little bit on, on the assessment of researchers. Um, you should realize that we are working in a merit-based uh, environment and, and that's what we like. We, we like to be rewarded for doing the good things and, and, and doing excellent things and, and not for the wrong things. And assessment is all over the place. Um, researchers are assessed for grant applications. Uh, they are uh, assessed when there are vacancy, uh, when they are up for promotion, uh, when they are up for tenure, for a professorship, for instance, or an associate professorship, and also for awards, again, assessment. So it, it matters, it matters a lot what we take into account when we assess researchers. Uh, and the bottom line is that when you have perverse incentives, researchers are facing dilemmas, moral dilemmas, if, if, if you want. And, and, and the basic thing is that when you have a dilemma, um, you have to make a choice between two things that are not completely uh, nice. Um, and here is the dilemma that what is good for truth finding, for the validity and the quality and the integrity of research is not always good for your academic career. It helps if you cut a few corners because it saves you time and, and it's a wonderful method to get more spectacular research. That is the dilemma we have to face. Um, and, and of course, it has to be faced by the researchers first and foremost, but their organizations need to help them by removing these perverse incentives as good as possible. And, and I'm, I'm just showing you also a, a, a bunch of articles along the way. And, 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 and please realize that I don't like to have references in the screen, but there are below the screen in, in the note fields and all of you will get uh, from the IARMA uh, the PDF of my presentation. And if you're interested, all the references are below there. And, and this is a, a paper which is rather saddening. These are two evolutionary biologists. These evolutionary biologists, they played a few games with numbers. They, they did some scenario analysis. And, and it's quite convincing uh, when they show that misbehaving, cutting corners uh, specifically, is good for you when you are in the current uh, uh, science system. Cutting corners help you to reach the top. It's good for your academic survival. So, and that, that makes, makes the dilemma real. W what is good for truth finding is not necessarily good for you. That, that is the issue. 
um, and we should change that, uh, I believe, and we should change that uh, by looking at the assessment system, because assessment is such a central thing in science. And, and by the way, uh, I, I'm, I don't think Stephanie said that before, but please type your questions when they pop up. Stephanie will interrupt me and she has the right to interrupt me at every stage in my uh, uh, talk. Uh, at the end, there might be some time left, there might be no time left, depending on what happens on the way. And I like it to be as interactive as possible. So, so please feel free to ask questions and I especially like it when you disagree with me. Now, this is what are the drivers, I believe at least, and it's a bit evidence-based, but not that much, I should admit. What I believe that are the drivers of the behavior of science. Uh, whether they engage in questionable research practices or responsible research practices. Of course, there is this moral compass, and you see it on the right side of your screen. Uh, and this is about whether the individual uh, has virtues and, and, and lives according to these virtues in, in academia. The second thing is the climate in the lab, the local climate. Remember, we are social animals. Uh, we respond to our environment quite strongly. When everyone around you is cutting the same corner, you will start cutting it as well. It's, it's, it's hardly impossible to avoid it. And then there are these inadequate uh, incentives that need to be made adequate. Let's reward the right thing. Let's reward responsible research practices and not questionable research practices. And this is an ex exaggeration. This is how it, it, it might work. We all know that positive results are wonderful, really wonderful. They gain you uh, high impact publications, they gain you a lot of citations, they gain you media attention, and they help you enormously to the next grant and tenure. And the nice thing in a cynical way is that cutting corners, questionable research practices, and also research misconduct, of course, can help you to get positive results. In fact, they're wonderful to get positive and spectacular results. And there is the pressure from yourself and from the sponsors sometimes to engage in, in these, uh, uh, well, undesirable activities, I, I should say. And the, in the end, it might happen that there hardly is anything else published as a positive result, which, which is currently the state of affairs. I, I alluded to that uh, later on in my presentation, and that cannot be true. So we exaggerate the positivity and the spectacular results in our collective publication record, and that distorts our knowledge, that distorts our view on, on the stuff we, we want to understand. And that is bad, it's really bad. Um, institutions, they need to help us. Our research institutions need to help us. And this is a small paper where I outlined that. Um, and this is an other small paper um, uh, in, in uh, we are quite proud on it. Nick alluded to that already. It was in Nature uh, last week. And it, it, it is a kind of in-between climax of a big European consortium. And the European consortium have been working so hard to make it accessible best practices, guidelines, standard, rate, standard operating procedures, make them accessible and add them in a toolbox for institutions to, um, to do the right thing, to help their investigators to engage in responsible research practices. And that is where you come in, of course, as well. Uh, your type of, 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 of staff function in, in uh, research uh, organizations uh, is essential to have the right uh, uh, procedures and policies and, and tools and uh, facilities in place. And Perhaps. this is trying to guide you. A question, yes. Stephanie. Yes, we have indeed uh, a question and it is exactly about uh, the tools and the uh, processes we have in place. So it matches perfectly. Uh, the question is from Selina Cohen. Um, and uh, her question is, um, the metrics uh, we have are especially important for the experimental and applied sciences, but um, she was wondering if you could elaborate more on social sciences and humanities. Well, that's, that's a really neat question. Um, and, and like all good questions, it's, it's a difficult question, which is almost important to answer um, uh, for me. Uh, 
the, the point is that the, the spot has been very much on, on empirical science, especially in, in biomedicine and, and in psychology. Uh, other social sciences and the humanities have been neglected a little bit. And, and even when you talk to them and say, hey, listen, what, what are your questionable research practices? Um, people have no clue because the, the concept doesn't ring a, a, a bell. Uh, and when you delve deeper, they, they end up with stories about plagiarism and theft of, of, of beautiful ideas and so on and so forth. Um, and, and that is awful, of course, but we, we need a lot of work to do there. And, and, and it is happening. Um, uh, for this, this European project, uh, we have run uh, multiple, many, many tens of focus groups interviews on the disciplinary level. And, and the most interesting to me are uh, exactly the focus group that has been engaged in the humanities uh, and then, then the, the, the corners of humanities that do not work with empirical research, where, what, which seems to be the majority there, uh, and also the social scientists other than the sociologists and the psychologists. And we learned a lot of interesting things from that. And yes, the conclusion was that there aren't that many good practices and that many uh, guidelines. And that's the reason uh, we are now, as part of the same European consortium, trying to make a few of these guidelines. Uh, they're not yet available. There are some, some small examples uh, already on the table, uh, but, but please bear it with us for a few more years to, to get some more information on that. So relevant questions um, in, uh, in uh, unsatisfactory answer. I'm sorry for that. It's not yet ready. Um, this is ready. This is the toolbox uh, I was alluding to. Uh, uh, it was just opened last week. So, so have a look. Uh, um, I hope you find tools you like and you can use in your work. Um, and if not, uh, try again in a few months because the toolbox only started to fill. We, we will fill it with tools from this European Software RI Consortium over the next two, two, two years to come. We are still funded by the European Commission and we're working quite dedicated and hard to fill it with tools. And the tools are meant inspirational. Um, it, it's looking like this. There are tools for support, there are tools to organize stuff, there are the tools to communicate. Uh, the structure is, is, is quite clear, at least that's what we believe. And if you don't agree, tell us and then my, maybe we can change it. And, and this is the basic grid of the whole thing. These are the three things on the left. Um, you, know, you have the, the support, the organization and the communication. And each of the three, uh, three is a nice number we thought, uh, has three subtopics or topics, and, and we uh, give some examples here. This is a very, very top level summary, but you might recognize already a few of these terms. Um, and I'm not going to, 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 to work through them all. Hey? Integrity training has been mentioned, and, and the AARMA has published a, a really neat uh, uh, guideline for that, uh, that was alluded to by Nick. Uh, or by Barana, I think it was Barana. Uh, uh, supervision and mentoring is, is awfully important and, and we can do a much better job, we believe. You have, of course, the, the ethics structures and committees, uh, what to do with breaches, what to do with data, the whole fair story, uh, how to collaborate, how to handle uh, uh, competing interests uh, and how to publish uh, and communicate. It's all in there and, and in our nature paper, we say basically two things. Um, one is all these nice topics are important. All these nine topics are important. And secondly, you should have a plan. Uh, we call that a research integrity promotion plan. And in that plan, uh, research performing organizations, yeah, that is our jargon for universities, uh, university medical centers, uh, not for profit and for profit research enterprises all take together you should have a, a coherent plan that shows what you are going to do as an organization on these nine levels and it should be adapted to to your business to your country to your disciplines and so on and so forth but but all these elements should be in 
And today the focus is on fair assessment. And that is what the Hong Kong principles are all about. Uh, I don't talk about the others, but they will pop up because fair assessment means that you're looking into these nine topics and see whether investigators behave well under the heading of these nine topics. And for that, you need to gain points for your promotion, for your grant, and for your tenure. And that, that is the rhythm, that is the idea. Uh, Lex, we have an, uh, another question. Nice. Um, this one is from Marusha. Hi, uh, Marusha. Um, you mentioned the role of institutions um, as, as guidance for, for researchers and in changing these incentives, but uh, what other stakeholders uh, should or could uh, play a role in this? Uh, Marusha thinks, of course, about the funders, uh, but maybe you see uh, more or others as well. Yeah, that's 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 a great question, uh, and and it's it's a bit more simple than the former one, at least in theory. Uh, yes, there are many stakeholders. Yes, they all matter. Uh, we have alluded to the researchers themselves and and to their uh, employers, their research institutions, and and that is the core to me. Uh, but also important, and 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 it, they can really make the difference. Are funders and also journals. Funders and journals have a big advantage. They don't have to be popular. When, when they take measures, we will comply. We want their money. We want to be in the columns of these journals. So it, it can be an easy shortcut to improvement when journals say, hey, listen, we only look at your paper when your data sets are public and then data sets will be public in, in future. Uh, and funders can also say, hey, listen, you only get a grant when you apply from an organization that has a research integrity promotion plan installed, alive and kicking and being executed well, and then it will happen. So maybe in, in, in the sense of power, funding agencies and journals are much more powerful than institutions and individual researchers. Uh, and we all have to align our work and to collaborate together. Um, and, and, and one final word on that, that sop for ri uh, consortium, the European grants uh, uh, we are working on. Um, I focus now on research uh, institutions but the other half of this consortium uh, activities are focused on making a similar toolkit for funding agencies. What are the tools for them to get their act together to foster research integrity? That is the idea. This is the Hong Kong principles paper. Uh, have a look. It's, it's quite readable. It's not that long. Um, and these are the five principles. And, and I will go through them. Um, first the first three together and then the, the the last two together the first three are uh, like has been said already we should assess responsible research practices across the board the whole range um, and then we should specifically value complete reporting because uh, selective publication uh, publication bias outcome reporting bias uh, citation bias all these things are, are wrong, and I will allude to that later. And it's a lot of work to do all these nice things, and we should reward people to taking the effort to, to engage in complete reporting. And then in more general sense, we should also reward other elements of open science. Open science is not a magic bullet, uh, and it's also a, a sect if, if you are not careful. But I like the ideas a lot because they help us to, to improve the quality of research and also to foster research integrity. So uh, just before this, this meeting, the second speaker alluded to the fact that maybe when we revise the European Code of Conduct on Research Integrity, it should aim more to open science. I, I warm heartedly agree that that is important and that is the way forward. So now some examples. Transparency. Transparency is a core concept to me. It is so important for many reasons. First and foremost, to, to check uh, the work of your colleagues. Uh, first and foremost, to, to, to reuse a work that has been done before you and also to understand what you're reading. 
uh, there are several elements of open science, um, open methods and open data, which are essential, essential to research integrity, I believe. Open method means that you first write a research protocol, completely detailed, uploaded in the cyberspace, timestamped uh, before you start collecting data. So then later on, everyone can go back to your plan and its later uh, amendments and see whether you delivered on your promises. So that, that is important and it's essential when you want to, to be able to check whether what people did is what they promised. Same holds for the data analysis plan, same holds for the amendments, uh, and same holds for the data sets. After the thing is done, uh, removing confidential stuff, of course, and blurring it a little bit, and that can be quite complex, I know, but it can be done usually, you need to park your data sets in the cyberspace as well for reuse by others. Now, all these things need to be done prospectively. First upload them, and then uh, do, do the next step. Um, and I like it a lot when it is public, uh, but that is not essential. That is nice to have, uh, prospectively is need to have. Uh, it is nice to have when everyone uh, has access to these things, but it's not necessary. Uh, there can be embargoes, uh, there can be uh, 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 criteria to, uh, to use it and so on and so forth. I don't like it that much, but it can be done. So open science, uh, uh, I'm open source, that's open methods, basically. I mentioned open data already. Uh, open methods is also uh, research protocols. Uh, and there are some other branches like, like uh, open peer review. I like that a lot as well. Um, open access, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. Nice to have, not need to have, I'm in favor. And the same holds for open educational resources. And, and one is not mentioned in this wheel, um, and that is citizen science. And I won't allude to that, but that's an interesting uh, uh, thing as well. Um, there are nowadays batches, journals. This is what journals can do, uh, give you a batch for uh, being pre-registered, uh, open methods that is, uh, and batches for open data, and, and people respond to that. There has been clinical trials, or randomized trials, I should say, uh, showing that it helps. We are just, just children. Children in primary school, they, they like to have some nice stamps on, 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 on their work. It's the same with us, with scientists. And then there is this, this go fair movement, the fair principles, that's wonderful as well. These are quite reasonable and usable principles to handle your data and to make your data available after your project. Uh, it has been uh, embraced by many funding agencies uh, and journals already. Um, and I'm, I'm very much in, uh, 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 a fan of the, the development because it, it, it really helps us. It improves uh, the quality of science. Um, I, I'd like to show one, one interesting thing I, I really like a lot. And I, I really like this a lot. And, and that is registered report. Um, it is rather new. Uh, it, it, it popped up uh, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, and it's such an excellent idea. It's one of these ideas. I'm, 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 I'm feeling a little bit jealous that I was not the inventor of the idea because it's so, so wonderful and so simple. It's still in a really advanced stage. And this is how it goes. You have an idea for a study and possibly also have a grant for that study when you need to grant for it then you write an introduction and a method paragraph, a quite extensive method paragraph, all the details should be uh, in there. Um, and then you submit it to a journal. So, so please note, there, is no, there are no data. Um, so the journal needs to make a decision whether they want to publish your paper. That's unusual because normally journals look what are the results and whether they like the results and on the basis of that, they decide to publish. That is a strong driver of publication bias, of course. We don't want it anymore. And this is the killer for, for, for selective reporting and publication bias. You have first uh, acceptance of your paper, then you start analyzing your data, you write the rest of your article after the analysis, 
and the journal is publishing it. They're checking, of course, whether you did what you promised uh, and whether it, it is well written and so on and so forth. And you may have a few other loops of, of uh, responding to, to review comments uh, here as well. But basically, it will be published. That, that is the commit. Next, we, uh, we have a question um, regarding just that. Um, so I think you perfectly explained, and that was also part of the question, that uh, the, the uh, study protocol happens ahead of the actual uh, research. So that part of the question is indeed already answered. Um, the second part was, how can we assure the researcher that some other less ethical research doesn't steal that protocol and uses it faster? Yeah, that's, that's a worry I, I, I hear quite often and, and I can understand it, but it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's strong. Uh, because remember, when you register, have a register report or pre-register uh, um, and, and have it on a website somewhere, these things are timestamped. So you can always prove to be the first. You can always prove to be the first to claim the idea, to claim the protocol. Uh, so someone else can steal it. Yes, when it is published, they can steal it. And when, and when it's embargoed, uh, they cannot steal it because they cannot see it. Uh, still, reviewers can steal your ideas. And, and yes, that happens. That happened with grant application and, and with, with journal papers. And it's awful. It's, it's, it's wrong, of course, and it, it should be penalized. But basically, when you pre-register, your stuff and have a registered report, you have a timestamp proof that you were the face, that's the first. So priority is, is not the issue. The, the issue can be that other people have better funds and are, are, are more uh, organized and are in, in nature of science just before you. And, and that is awful, of course. But then you can write to, to that journal and say, hey, listen, you have to pull this down because they stole my idea. And, and possibly they will do so, or at least uh, uh, notify the readers what happened. What I forgot is um, to say with the registered report, what is the bonus? The, the bonus is wonderful. And, and, and I'm, well, I'm a methodologist by, by, by trade, uh, and I have the weird habit to always find faults and make suggestions in research methods when I review a paper. And only recently I discovered how stupid that is because the work has been done already. There is no way to improve it anymore for, for the poor people on the other side of, of the line. Uh, but that is different with registered reports. When there is valid criticism, good suggestions by the reviewers, you can adopt them. You can just change your study. Uh, and, and that can never happen with, with the traditional publication. You can actually improve the quality of the study uh, by taking aboard what reviewers suggest. It is, isn't that wonderful? That, that is a bonus. And I love being a reviewer of registered reports because now what I say might matter. And I, I, I told you that this would be the killer of uh, selective publication. And yes, it is. Th this is these are the first results. Uh, what you see here are registered reports and a percentage of null findings. There's negative findings not showing what you were looking for. 60% negative finding in, in resident reports. And when you match a similar paper in the traditional uh, uh, literature, you get something less than 15% negative results. Now, this is to me pretty convincing. It shows that here there is suppression of negative results. And here there is no suppression or at least less suppression of, of negative results. And I guess it, are, it is no suppression. There are two subgroups here. The, this is in replication studies and this is in, in novel research, but the confidence interval overlap. So I won't allude to, to any differences there. So 60% less than 50%. That, that is to me quite convincing. This is a killer of, of selective reporting and publication bias. And, and this is a, 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 an awful thing. And I'm, maybe you've seen this example before. It's, it's one of my favorite slides. It's a slide from, from a need study um, with a gold standard. 
these are 105, I'm sorry, randomized clinical trials uh, that studied, that compared an antidepressant drug against placebo. Um, half of them show positive results, half of them show negative results. And this is the level of data. This is FDA. People at the FDA, they want your data. They're, they're not interested in your articles. They want your data and they reanalyze your data. So I consider this to be the gold standard. Now, when you go a few years down the line, you see that with the exception of one, all the green dots, all the positive studies have been studied and only half of the negative studies. And this is where we usually start. Uh, this is normal. This is what we see. We say, well, it, there are a number of negative studies, but mostly the stuff works, which is not true. It's half half. But it gets worse. Um, people measure much more than what are, they report. Um, and that brings in outcome reporting bias. You can select the positive outcomes and suppress or ignore the negative outcomes. And that is what happens. Uh, some of these negative studies in their publications, when you start reading, they become have become positive just because the negative primary outcome was suppressed. And the, the secondary outcomes sometimes are promoted to, to primary outcomes, which are positive. So now the negativity is almost gone. It gets worse still. People use words when they write their articles, and that gives spin to your interpretation, especially in abstracts and discussion sections. And you can shred doubt on negative studies, and then you make them yellow or, or even uh, light green. And away, almost completely away, goes the negativity. Compare this one to that one. This is what we read in the literature. This one is what we hardly ever know. And it, it gets even one step worse when you go to the next generation of publication. Um, it has been shown, um, for instance, by two of my PhD students, that positive studies are cited three to five times as more as negative studies. So the green bu bullets uh, uh, are bigger in the next generation and the red bullet, the negative studies, they, they shrink. So when you, you go to the to, to the, the, the secondary literature, to the, the, the article citing these, these trials, it's completely disordered. And I, my, 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 I suppose that this is happening all over the place. We, we, we cannot see it because we have no gold standard, but this is the drama we are facing. And of course, this is one of the root causes of the replication crisis. If you're interested, these are two beautiful reports uh, freely available on the replication crisis and how to fight it. Um, and these are a few more of the courses of replication crisis. We have alluded to uh, quite extensively to, to the, the, the bad thing of selective reporting, but there is more. Also low power, that is small studies. We do a lot of small studies uh, like they, they are doing in animal research, for instance. Uh, it, it is quite tempting to publish only the positive ones. And, and we can understand with some, some reflection of at least 30 seconds that these positive studies might be chance findings uh, uh, almost always. So what happens is you see only chance findings or, or, or almost only chance findings in the literature. People start believing that and you have a completely distorted picture because all the negative studies uh, were never published. P-hacking. That's number three. P hacking is 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 interesting, and um, one of my favorite biostatisticians he he always said, "Well, listen, if you torture your data enough, they will always confess," and that is what happened. Give a statistician a random data set, um, and he or she will find immediately a few spectacular subgroups um, by tweaking the cutoff points, doing this and doing that. When you test enough, you will always find something that is statistically significant. And this is one of the main reasons uh, why you should pre-register your data analysis plan. You should say what you're going to test before you start collecting your data, because after you have data, you, you can test until the, cow, the cows come home and you will find 
always something statistically significant. And the only thing you have to do then is to invent a nice story to, to what you found. And we call that harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. This king knew it already. He, he sh shoots, his, shoots his arrows to the wall, and then the lackey here makes sure that he hits the bullets all the times. It's, it's not that difficult when you found a nice table to invent a story and a theory behind the table and to write it down whether you had the theory and the hypothesis first and then started collecting data. That is wrong. And pre-registration and uh, registered reports are killing that option. Um, and replication, this, this is a very small, cleverly written article from John Ioannidis, and he explains um, it's so stupid that we focus on, on innovation and discovery in, in research. Um, we are ignoring that replication is much more important. You cannot trust these new findings before they have been replicated. Then you can trust them. Uh, so that, that is more essential than innovation. You need them both, of course, but we ignore replication. Uh, many researchers think that it's boring. Uh, it's not good for your career, and they're right. It's difficult to get a grant for replication, and it's very difficult to get it published. Up to recently, because now you have wonderful uh, open access journals uh, like PLOS ONE and British Medical Journal Open, and they publish everything because they are digital, and they don't mind how many papers they publish as long as the papers are good quality. Uh, they, don't, they don't mind what the results are, and that is a wonderful uh, uh, um, thing. Uh, and the other wonderful thing to get replication studies published is the registered report, of course, I alluded to before. Let's move on to the second uh, set of the five uh, Hong Kong principles. These are the last two. Um, and it, the first, number four says, acknowledge a broad range of research and uh, activities. And number five is recognize essential other tasks like, like peer review and, and mentoring. This, this again is the, the broadening of the scope to, to reward explicitly what matters, stuff that takes a lot of time and energy and is normally ignored in assessment procedures. And, and that sends the strong message to researchers that these things don't matter, which is wrong because they do matter. They, they matter a lot, in fact. Uh, research climate, research culture, and, 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 and caring for that and caring for the research cultures by others is important. I, I alluded to that already before. Um, please have a look, if you have not yet done that, at the welcome report that appeared a few months ago. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's a survey uh, among uh, investigators, among researchers, and they tell you what their perception of the culture they work in is. And it's not nice uh, on all levels. In fact, it's awful on, on, on many levels. So we need to improve these things. That is important. Lex, I, uh, I have a question that uh, links to that uh, partially. Um, and it is a question from Katarina Miller. Um, in the fair assessment, do you integrate a gender uh, perspective? Uh, and she refers to a German uh, study that uh, journal German female law students receive worse marks than their male uh, colleagues. And there is also uh, a link to a uh, study from uh, September 2020 from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation under the uh, underrepresented and unheard uh, women in the COVID-19 uh, news. I will um, put the link to that um, in the chat so everybody can see, but uh, maybe you can take the question on the, uh, the gender part. Yeah, that's 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 a great question as well. Uh, but this is in the category of difficult questions. <laughs> the, 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 the point is that I fully agree and, and all the writers of the Hong Kong principles and, and as you know that, that that is a product of the, uh, the the six world conference on research integrity in Hong Kong. I, I forgot to tell you that that's the reason it's called Hong Kong principles. Uh, 
we had some discussions on the issue as well, whether uh, gender differences, um, ethnic differences, uh, and, and, and geographic differences, uh, lower middle income countries versus uh, more privileged countries should be integrated in the Hong Kong principles. And although we agree that these things are, are awful and are, are essential to be repaired in assessment procedures, not to uh, have them in the Hong Kong principles. And the reason for that is we wanted the Hong Kong principles to deal with research integrity solely. There, there are many principles to improve assessments. Uh, and, and personally, I agree to, to all of them as, as far as I know them. Uh, but the Hong Kong principles have a few on research integrity. And, and gender inequality, how awful as it is, and it is awful, uh, is not an aspect of research integrity. Research integrity is only something that concerns the quality and the validity and the trustworthiness of, of research results and, and the knowledge arising from that. Uh, and uh, you can link that to, to diversity, uh, but we decided not to do that. So that's, that's, that's more of a defense. Um, and at the same time, uh, we thought w when we include it, um, it, it's becoming too big uh, an issue because then you, 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 you draw a board, uh, 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 a lot of research and some of the, the wonderful articles that has just been mentioned, I know, you, you draw that aboard as well. Um, and these parties were, were not involved in writing the paper on the Hong Kong principles. As an author team, we had a few video conferences on the question, do we include diversity and, and gender inequality or not? And we made an anonymous decision not to do so, acknowledging that these things are important and, and awful like they go nowadays. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick reminder, Lex, you have uh, less than 10 minutes uh, left. Uh, we're doing well. Okay, we're doing well. I I'll reach the end, but I'm not sure there will be another, a lot of discussion time after this. But we discuss along the way, and that is exactly yeah. what, what I hope for. So that's good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You have the full, uh, the full time for, uh, for your presentation. Yeah, so, so, so go back to, to uh, culture. Uh, I recommended the welcome report already, read it. Uh, we studied it in Amsterdam as well. We, we did a few years ago a survey among all the uh, researchers in Amsterdam about, what was it, uh, eight, 9,000 uh, uh, researchers, uh, two universities, two university medical centers. And we looked at the research climate and the research culture as well. Uh, and we looked at publication pressure and alluding to one of the, the, the questions that has been posed earlier, we specifically looked into the differences between academic ranks and disciplinary fields. Um, and and we know, I don't have the time to tell it all. Uh, there is a neat website on it and, and below the screen there is a reference to that website. Um, and there is uh, a series of articles, um, and these are only two of them out of that project. But I want to say, show you one result, and that is on the research integrity climate. It turned out uh, from the survey and also from focus group interviews we, we had, um, we had many of them, that junior researchers perceive uh, the integrity climate much more negative than senior researchers. And also they think that their supervisor are too little committed to research integrity. When true, this is awful. And these are things we need to repair, of course. PhD students specifically, they see much more competition and suspicion um, than the more senior staff members. Uh, um, well, it's difficult to interpret, but, but there is a lot of competition and there may be a lot of suspicion. And then looking at the different disciplinary fields, national scientists have a, over, uh, across the board a more positive perception of the research integrity climate and social sciences and the humanities. They report to perceive less fairness, especially in publishing and acquiring funding. That might be because they are mainly teaching, which, which is the case in, in many countries nowadays. And, and are not so well equipped anymore to spend time on, on research, which, which is a sad thing in itself, of course. 
supervision it has been alluded to is 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 essential it's it's popping up from from every study uh, that's being done on it and the weird thing is that um, in, in in most countries you don't need a license to supervise which which is weird because it's such a responsible task you have in my university in my university medical center the last few years we uh, did a pilot uh, with a, a, a course uh, called superb supervision <coughs> sorry and that was meant for people who got their first phd student uh, and they loved it we intertwined supervision skills and open science skills uh, and that worked quite well so now it is part of the the, the mainstream uh, and the next step will be that it will be mandatory uh, for all new supervisors and we are also heading for uh, a course for uh, more senior supervisors who specifically they, they may know how to supervise but they have no clue about these open science uh, modalities and that course will be more geared uh, toward that direction so just an experiment uh, rewarding uh, reviewing of articles is is important as well i have alluded to that uh, and that includes pre-publication uh, uh, peer review that is preprints and post-publication peer review uh, that that is after the publication was there uh, lex we have a, a question um i'm checking uh, Wait, my computer is very slow. Ah, here we are. Uh, Nuria uh, asks, how do you propose to reward research integrity when resources are reduced in a research organization? That's, that, that is difficult. That is difficult. Uh, uh, but when you have no, um, no means to show um, that you are engaging in responsible research practices because you have no means for research, it, it is it it is difficult. So so uh, what what we will be doing uh, with the the World Conference on Research Integrity? I alluded already that we we drafted and endorsed the Hong Kong principles in Hong Kong. Uh, we had to postpone due to the COVID nineteen uh, the next World Conference in Cape Town. Instead of that, we will run a webinar a webinar in in May uh, early June next year, and one of the main issues in that webinar will be how can we adapt the hong kong principles to lower and middle income countries and and that is exactly what this question speaks to uh, and and the honest answer is that we don't know but we want to work in that direction uh, because it, it is fair to to have an adaption for people uh, working on the less privileged circumstances in in in, in research we believe uh, but we we wanted to talk with with people under these circumstances themselves. None of the authors of the Hong Kong principles are under these circumstances. So we, we better thought let's let's first uh, engage in interacting with them before making a modification. I have um, still one question uh, left here as well. Um, Often, uh, it's, it's a question from Mari, uh, often in science, the new inventions or outcomes are found by surprise or by mistake. Should there then be possibility to modify your pre-registered outline of your research or what should be done when there are surprising outcomes during the process? I love this question. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it, it gives me the opportunity to explain that my whole story is for hypothesis testing research. Uh, this is the main the, the domain of, of confirmatory uh, research, uh, of testing hypothesis and testing theories. Uh, the domain of invention, uh, th there are no rules. Anything goes to, to make an, a good invention, but you should report it uh, like it went. Uh, you, you cannot pre-register that you're going to uh, uh, invent something completely new, of course. It, it, it just happens. But you should not be saying that it was a an, an, an theory it was coming from and, and you had an hypothesis and now you proved it. So it's not hypothesis testing research. Invention is wonderful. Uh, and yes, somewhere in between, in, in 
every hypothesis testing research, you can do exploration as well. It's not forbidden to explore data sets. You only just have to report that you were exploring your data set and you were not testing a an hypothesis. And yes, you can also have along the way uh, insights that, that are wonderful. <coughs> and then you can make an amendment to your, your pre-registered report. And then readers will know that it might be partly or completely data-driven. And that's okay. You can do data-driven things, but please report them as being data-driven things. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I'd like to end this slide. It was on a, a pre- uh, and post-publication peer review, and that's important as well. This is a neat example of a modern journal. Uh, it's digital and it have, has all the good things. It, it has preprints, it has pre-publication peer review, it has post-publication peer review, it is versioning. Uh, and, and what I like as well is that all the review reports, which are open, of course, like it should be, uh, they get a DOI. So you can even get citations, where well, you still want citations for your uh, review and you can document them in your CV and they can easily count when you are up for your next assessment. Uh, so many more journals are doing similar things. Um, the Hong Kong Principles has a set of uh, indicators as well. Please have a look at it. It's, it's not yet perfect, I believe, but it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, and it follows the stages of the, the research. So this is an other angle, other angle to, to look at it. Uh, uh, we are still experimenting with it. And in a few years, we might update it, but it's, it's pretty neat already as it is, I believe. You can find it on, on the web, on, on the, the Conference on Research Integrity website. Please consider endorsing it as an institution or an individual. We, we love best practices. There are a few uh, only already, but we want to have a lot of best practices. We love to have translations. Uh, there are now Chinese, there's now a Chinese translation uh, and a Brazilian one, a Portuguese one will be ready in, in one or two weeks. Uh, and some people are working on other translations. So please broaden the, the, the Hong Kong principles and make it accessible for as many people as, as possible. And I will also upload my slide sets uh, here so that other people can, can use it when they want it. So let me repeat again at the end my um, core message. And I hope it, it rings a few more bells now after, after all my, my stories and deviations that we really should reward responsible research practices and not reward perverse incentives. Uh, so that, that means that we can still use bibliometric indicators. They have some nice usages, but let's never, never again start believing that they are um, all there is to research quality and to research integrity, which is foolish. We, sh we should abandon that. Now, if you're still hooked, uh, one year later than we wanted, please consider coming to Cape Town to our next world conference um, and, and look, have a look at our uh, world conferences uh, foundation website, because all the stuff of the first six conferences is there, including videos, presentations, what have you. So it, it can be a, a, a rather neat uh, resource and all our declarations like the Singapore statement, the Montreal statement, and, and also the Hong Kong uh, principles um, are there. I thank you for your attention. And maybe there are a few more minutes for questions. I'm not sure, Stephanie, what do you think? <laughs> I'm afraid uh, we're we're out of time, but uh, you did a great job. It was a great presentation and uh, perfectly on time. So um, I um, that leaves me just uh, announcing that we have a, a break uh, now and we reconvene and I'm checking with Borana um, for that detail. Yes. When do we exactly so we have a 15 minutes break and we'll be back at 10.20 for the second talk with Dorian. Okay, 10.20. Okay, thank you again, Lex. It was really interesting. Thank you, thank you. Thank you also from my side. Very inspiring. Thank you, Lex and Stephanie.
Hello, uh, welcome back. I hope you could stretch your legs during the break and are ready now for the second talk. Uh, we are all looking very much forward, I think. We'll have uh, Dorian Caracas from the European Commission and uh, Jonas will be the moderator of the session. Jonas, he is a um, research ethics and integrity coordinator at Stockholm University and he is also Arian co-chair. Jonas, this is for you now. Thank you, Barana. Uh, and I'm just going to introduce Dora very briefly. Uh, I don't have any <laughs> interesting secrets to reveal uh, in contrary to Stefan with respect to Lex, but, uh, uh, and I'm sure you all, all know uh, uh, Dorian pretty well. Um, uh, he has a background in biochemistry, so he's a researcher from, from the beginning, but then he has worked quite a long time with policy related things. Uh, uh, was responsible for the framework um, uh, program evaluation uh, and also set up a network for uh, evaluation of uh, RTD. Uh, but now he is um, uh, head of the research, integrity, uh, research ethics and integrity sector at the Commission. And he is going to tell us uh, about uh, the research ethics appraisal process and how that is going to, uh, well, in some respects, change uh, when a new framework program is launched. So thanks for being with us, Dorian, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much. Very nice to be uh, again uh, with you. Uh, I remember it was uh, some years ago in uh, Malta, I think, in the ARMA meeting in Malta that we started this kind of discussion where us from the European Commission and ARMA would be, in a sense, partners in uh, trying to do uh, the right thing, both in ethics and research integrity. And uh, I still remember the idea of having a, a network uh, from your side uh, that was created, I think, two, three years ago, and then how this mature. And really, uh, uh, I hope that we will continue this collaboration because from outside, definitely, uh, we learn from you. Uh, you are uh, the people on the ground, the people that have to deal with uh, the research teams, with the individual researchers, the people sometimes that have to explain to them uh, the processes or lead them to the areas where they will understand what Horizon, what the framework programs are asking from them, and to lead it a little bit uh, to the previous presentation, which I think ties very well with uh, what uh, Lex mentioned about uh, the research climate, uh, the virtues, and uh, the, the incentives. Uh, we are past part of the uh, largest incentive provided in Europe with our framework programs. So it's very important that all those things come together and they come together primarily for us through uh, the ethics uh, review process. Uh, and we hope that part of this knowledge from what we have done or what has been done in ethics over 70 or more years becomes not a mirror, but gives some feedback into how the research integrity process should be, or rather how it should not be designed. Uh, we try to emphasize the positive. We always try and say even now that ethics is not a red tape mechanism. We don't want integrity to become only about misconduct, it has to be primarily about the research culture and how we improve research and research data and research results. So I think with those two pillars of the research house, ethics and integrity are so well connected that we have to be careful to do justice to both when we design the processes uh, to accommodate the needs that the two processes, the two pillars have. Uh, it is very important also to uh, mention that uh, everybody is under pressure for resources. So at some point, there have to be decisions that need to be made. Horizon Europe was exactly in the same situation as we are in many of our countries. There's always pressures for budget and human resources. So there have to be some changes. The basic proposal that the member states have accepted, next slide, uh, Nick, thanks. 
I'm sorry, but Nick has to uh, to do the slides from our side or Boran. I'm not sure who is doing it. Uh, so sorry that you will be listening to this next next thing. Uh, and please interrupt me with questions. We'll do it exactly the same way as Lex did it. If you have questions, please uh, put them forward and uh, Jonas will uh, inform me about the question and then I will try to give an answer. Um, it is also the article in Horizon Europe, which is now article 15 uh, about ethics is what we consider a stable article. Means that there is already agreement between the parliament and the council on the focus and scope of the article. Surprises might come always even at the last minute, but we treat it as an article that will appear as such in the final Horizon Europe documentation uh, regulation. Obviously, it continues from uh, Horizon 2020. So you have the same uh, reference to the large legal text like the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. Next slide. Of course, it reaffirms the commitment of the highest ethical standards in EU research, and it reaffirms the commitment to what we call EU values, among which we have human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, human rights and rights of minorities. The underlying part, of course, it is extremely important because it also is the core of research ethics. The ethics, the article makes a mention, reminds uh, the ethics principles. Uh, all of them are important, right? All of them are weighted against each other, but all of them are important. But for our task and for your task as research managers, we have to underline the fact that proportionality is extremely key to the compliance part. It is key to drafting and preparing proper ethics annexes in your application. What I mean is that you don't take a gun to a knife fight. Huh? If your research is about uh, collecting uh, unanonymized data, and it is always an instruction from our side that as much as possible, the data that you, that you uh, collect will be, should be anonymized, you do not have to recite the principles of data prote protection and privacy. If your research does something that is considered to be a normal procedure within your institution or within the European context, you do not need to recite Aristotle or Socrates or Kant. I mean, you can do it in a way that is proportional to what your research protocols are. Of course, the right to privacy and the protection of personal data is a main issue that we see in 99.9% .9 of all our proposals. That includes, of course, uh, that entails, of course, that there is adequate support in the institutional level for addressing those issues. What we are trying to do in Article 15, next slide, please, is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is the exclusion uh, uh, area, so we'll not find, finance human cloning, uh, anything that modifies the genetic heritage, and uh, we cannot, in a European level, create human embryos only for the purposes of uh, the research. I think those are non-go areas that have been there since FP6, I think, or FP7, uh, and they will not change. And of course, none of the activities will lead to the destruction of human embryos. This is extremely important because we still get discussions with researchers that they will say, but in my country, we are allowed to do X, Y, and Z. In your country, you are, but you cannot get funding from the European Union for this part of the research. There is an agreement at the European level that the research will not lead to the destruction of human embryos. Will not lead means that the embryos cannot be terminated, cannot be wasted, even after the experiment is done. It's a very strict rule, 
but that's what the rule that the member states have agreed on. Um, so the all this, of course, will uh, not be financed and obviously will not give money to any activity that is uh, forbidden in all member states or it's forbidden in one particular member state because, as we know, there are different uh, laws and, uh, that apply in different member states in some particular areas. A good part for ethics may be an issue of attention for you. You remember that in Horizon 2020, ethics dealt also with the issue of focus on civil applications, meaning that we could not have necessarily direct applications in military uh, implementation through the Horizon 2020 funding. Obviously, that created tremendous tension in the ethics panels because the ethics panels, as we have discussed many times before, are allergic to certain things. One of the allergies that they have is the term military. I'm not discussing here with you if it's fair or unfair. I'm just talking about a general feeling that exists among ethics experts. In Horizon Europe, civilian applications, the focus on civilian application issue will be dealt outside the ethics panels, outside the ethics review process, and we want to make it mostly an issue of confirmation from the applicants and a part of the discussion that can take place in the scientific uh, panels because they know better, the scientific experts know better which technology and how could have such a misinterpretation, let's say. The other issue that is not going to be anymore under uh, ethics is dual use. We have discussed it many times together and with many other uh, networks that again, dual use is a very peculiar category for ethics that created a lot of tension for the simple reason that it ended up being discussed only in ethics, which was quite unfair for all these technologies. For the same reason that ethics panels do not necessarily have the capacity or the knowledge, and they have a bias, if you like, against anything that can be used outside a civil context, a civilian context, could not always deal comfortably with the issue of dual use. So now the dual use issue will be uh, dealt again under the scientific evaluation for the same reasons as uh, I said before uh, for the civilian uh, focus. Now, um, in the European legislation, integrity is under ethics. Let's not discuss the merits of this inclusion. Again, there are many discussions in the academic community if ethics is in integrity or integrity is in ethics. Uh, it's an interesting academic discussion administratively and process-wise in most of our jurisdictions, in most of our countries, there are separate processes that deal with research ethics and with research integrity or research misconduct, as the, the case might be. For, European, for the European Union, for the framework program, integrity is into ethics. That's why integrity is mentioned in both the article of uh, Horizon Europe and in the new grant agreement, Article 13, this is the contract that the research communities have with the framework program when they receive funding from uh, the framework program. And there we reiterate the uh, uh, principles that are uh, included in uh, the European code. Uh, next slide, please. Including the fact that the European code for the first time in our, well, in our efforts, is mentioned directly into the Horizon Europe article on ethics. So it becomes 
part of the must lines, must pay attention to uh, documents within the Horizon Europe regulation. I underline the fact that this is a regulation. It becomes automatically something that all member states agree to follow. It becomes part of the legislative um, volume of uh, applications in Hori of uh, implementation in uh, research funding and research implementation. So integrity is recognized at the highest level in the regulation and the European code also is part of this uh, reg regulation, which is extremely important because that's how we make uh, the, um, uh, the understanding or the knowledge that the commission pays due attention both to ethics and integrity known to, to you as our interlocutors, our gatekeepers, and also to the research community. Uh, uh, Nick, can we go back to the previous slide? Sorry, yes, thank you. Uh, another important element that the article of Horizon Europe brings into the forefront is a direct mention of the appraisal process and most explicitly of the ethics self-assessment. You know, we have discussed it in previous meetings in, when in other fora that we always ask the applicants to complete an ethics self-assessment. You will not be surprised, and I'm sure that you have seen it also in, uh, in your institutions. Sometimes, and hopefully that will change, ethics is thought of five minutes before deadline. So if you have a 12 o'clock midnight deadline for your application, first of all, the coordinator is looking for all the partners that are vacationing up in the mountains or anywhere else they want to be, or at least they used to, uh, in order to collect the last pieces of information to put into the application, so the application will be complete. One of those last items is sometimes ethics. So it becomes like, uh, okay, it's quarter to 12, what about ethics? And then, of course, everything is done at the last minute. And the ethics self-assessment is not something that will do justice to, your, to the researcher's work. The commission will run the process anyway. But it does not do justice to what our researchers are trying to do if they have a really last minute consulted and um, drafted ethics self-assessment. Ethics self and sometimes it's not even included. Now, if I would be acknowledging loudly the fact that everybody has tremendous pressure for human resources. I could say it's ethics self, self assessment is not included. This proposal should not be processed. Obviously, we don't want to do that. Obviously, what we want to do, because we believe that we have a much better effect, is what we jokingly uh, discuss among ourselves, we like to torture a little bit our researchers. We, we want to go back with more information about the ethics, give us more information or respond to that question or make sure that you address this. We still think that if you reject the proposal because somebody didn't pay attention, let's take, uh, yeah, not the best reason for not having a good ethics self-assessment, you penalize people that are not necessarily there planning to do something wrong. So we are trying to provide with you an environment that fosters some kind of more ethical thinking, that ethics should be part of the design rather than only a, com a, a compliance tick box approach. So in the new uh, Horizon Europe article, the member states say clearly that the commission will not focus on legal compliance. This remains the responsibility at the local level of the host institutions of the industry SME that is participating. And that you should have an ethics self-assessment, a properly completed ethics self-assessment. So due attention should be paid to that part when you design your research application. 
Also, the regulation says that the commission services, so my sector, and all the people that are involved into the ethics process uh, in the agencies and all the different instruments, will be focused only on complex and serious ethics issues in among all the applications that we receive. To give you a kind of uh, breakdown, what we call now complex and serious ethics issues would be easily understood when we publish a guidance note, and that will become available soon. But also it can be understood in a risk assessment scale. The complex and serious ethics issues that the Commission will focus on are the high risk areas of research, including ethics. Huh? Not high risk because you can be a high risk area of research and not have any ethics issues. So high risk and as far as the issues that your research, ethics issues that your research raise. The old uh, thank you, Nick. The old part that we called ethics screening is the medium and low risk. And there the Commission will not pay the same kind of attention as we did in Horizon uh, 2020 in F and in FP7, which means that all the proposals in the low, medium risk area become, as they always were, the sole responsibility of the host institutions. We don't leave them without attention, and we'll go back a little bit later, but it is important to note that you have a low medium risk application that has been selected for funding. The local structures are responsible for whatever is required under European and national law in order to satisfy the ethics issues or address the ethics issues that are raised by that proposal. And of course, we will keep the ethics checks for selected projects. We will focus mainly on complex and serious ethics issues. But obviously, we will, we can choose proposals that from the low and medium risk category. Uh, Next slide. This approximately means that um, a, depending on how the New Horizon uh, Europe uh, first calls go, and I, I, accept, I expect that the initial numbers that will be quite higher than normal in the complex and serious cases category, uh, that the Commission services will focus more on the ethics checks, so what is happening after the contract, rather than ex ante, what is happening when you put forward the application. That does not mean that the application will not be judged on the contents of its Horizon uh, Europe ethics part. That will be judged, but our services with the ethics review will pay more attention ex post after the contract is signed. The Sorry, ethics issue. you want to take a question? Sometimes? Sure, of course, sure, of course. Uh, okay, um, so we have we have uh, two, two questions from the, from the participants. One, the first one is from Katharina Miller. Yes. And it connects back to what you said earlier about um, uh, proportionality and, and then you mentioned privacy issues, uh, uh, personal data protection as one of the most important, one of the things Things, one of the issues that are most frequent uh, in, in the projects that you assess. And the question concerns precisely uh, the GDPR. And uh, it is, the question is, um, in your opinion, does GDPR limit our possibilities to good research, uh, especially in humanities or social science? Uh, I, that is Katrina, who was asking the question, have the impression that most researchers from humanities and social science and the research institutions are quite irritated and feel quite insecure with GDPR. What can we do about this? More education, trainings for researchers? Can you repeat the second part of your question? Because there was that an was interruption. A of questions in one. But... The first one I got, the second part. Okay, sorry. Yeah, the, the second was uh, that there's this, uh, uh, a lot of researchers and institutions are a bit annoyed and feel insecure with the GDPR. And, uh, 
that we can do about this? Is there some sort of education or training for researchers, for instance, that can help out with this? All right, uh, thank you. Um, my personal opinion is that the, the GDPR does not impede research from happening. It, it, it just, it, it gives it a little bit more of, uh, more turns in the meander of designing a proper research protocol. But that being said, the new regulation, because it's a pretty big piece of legal work, requires support. You cannot expect, like we did until recently, and probably will continue to do, unfortunately, our researchers to be research managers, innovators, ethics experts, data protection experts, intellectual property rights experts, and of course, tomorrow, artificial intelligence experts. All those things cannot be done by one person or by a group of people. It requires a preparatory a preparation or steps to be taken at the host institutional level. Remember most of you that years ago, we didn't have a DPO at an, a, a research institution. I mean, the only people that understood data protection 10 years ago were the doctors that were running clinical trials. They had the framework, they had the training, they had the statisticians or whatever, they had the structure around them that helped them to deal with the uh, regulatory uh, uh, issues. I'm not saying that we should build the same framework as clinical trials for everything else, but it's not possible to demand our researchers to have all this expertise ready and available on their draw. And together, we are trying to solve that issue. How? Through trainings, through guidelines, and we definitely need a lot more than this. Already, we are working very close with the European Data Protection Advice Board uh, to develop specific guidelines for research. Now, mind you, and you know that, because all of you had to explain research to some hierarchy or a political structure, a policy structure. People outside the research endeavor do not understand, neither probably they do need to understand how research works. The intricacies of multiple projects, multiple partners, either in Europe or all over the world that exchange data from personal data to anything else is so complicated that a person that makes a policy decision doesn't necessarily have to know all the intricate details. The same with data protection. Data protection experts, when you explain to them what you are trying to do with your research data that relate to human beings, they look at you with wide eyes full of surprise. How come an a PhD student can collect this type of data and promise in his application that has been approved by everybody that this data will be sent all over the world. It's beyond them, but it's because they do not know how research works. So yes, more training, more education, and that will come slowly, but definitely the GDPR is not a problem for uh, research. It requires uh, changing the way we think and we do research, but open science does the same thing and artificial intelligence will do the same thing also. So we are at the hiatus in research design, I think. I think I kind of try to answer both questions. If there are more, we can continue later. Yeah. I think it was uh, an ex excellent uh, reply. We have, we have another question concerning okay. uh, dual use, just very briefly. Uh, so it's, it's quite concrete, so, so maybe you can answer that a bit shortly. But uh, does the exclusion, uh, so, uh, so it's from, from John Pearson, I think. Uh, it's not, his full name doesn't appear, but I think it's John Pearson. Uh, our university has an ethics committee for dual use. Does the exclusion of dual use from ethics assessment mean that projects with dual use won't need approval from such a committee in Horizon Europe? Uh, no, I mean, we will not 
required. And I can tell you right now that the ethics panels will always find a way to address dual use within their uh, requirements or application, but it's not a must anymore, right? So if from your institution, you have an ethics committee that deals with dual use, or you have a committee that deals with the dual use as we do have in Germany. In Germany, we have a, a separate committee that deals with dual use issues. Those opinions are more than welcomed in the application phase, or at least you can say in the application that I will get uh, the opinion or the approval from my ethics committee or my structure, whatever structure I have. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, we have we have two more questions. Do you want to wait with those? Or no, no. Let's let's go ahead because I'm yeah. Okay. So one is from uh, Joanna Procell, and it concerns. Uh, as I understood, it's uh, how um, uh, what goes into the equation when you uh, make the assessment of whether something is high or medium risk. So, so risk is not only the research per se, what's going to be done, but uh, also the applicant's approach to ethics issues. I mean, someone with limited knowledge or awareness or, or with uh, perhaps not the resources uh, uh, required to perform the project in a safe way at the institution where they're at. Uh, are these things that go into the equation where you, when you evaluate the, the, the risk of the project, or is it just sort of content of the research as it were? In, in, in the eyes of, or in the minds of our ethics uh, experts, this uh, part of the equation, it's always present. And they can see it from the way the application has been drafted, uh, prepared. And, you all know when you've seen application, you know that the person knows what they are talking about or just copy paste uh, parts of legislation in order to prove or try to prove that they know what uh, uh, they're talking about. Uh, the, I think you have to wait for the guidance to come out on complex and serious cases, uh, but let's face also another uh, reality. Not everything that is important to ethics and research ethics can be solved via the ethics review process. I know that there is a very strong tendency among all of us to use the ethics review in order to push the new directions in ethics. We have to be very careful that we do not use a vehicle as a policy instrument. Sometimes we do. Right? I mean, the regulation, the Horizon Europe regulation says how the ethics review will be done. But we have to be very careful not to use the ethics review as the only mechanism for improving the ethics. There are other mechanisms that uh, Katrina, Katrina mentioned in her question that have to do with local education, lo local training, and empowering of the local structures in order to support the researchers. Uh, that is where I would like to leave it for uh, for the moment, uh, Jonas. Thanks. Oh, All right. The questions are sort of <laughs> coming in here. Uh, That's good. <laughs> uh, could we just do, do one more? Uh, it's a fairly big question, I think. But if you could just have a brief comment on uh, Mette Kamen's question, which is, uh, I see a challenge in mixing the concept of ethics and GDPR. That is, that ethics is reduced to dealing with privacy legislations. Do you have any comments on that? I I mean, this should be somewhere a, a banner. It is absolutely true. And we say, it, it, we say it in all our documents. Let's not confuse what ethics does for privacy with what the law also says and does for privacy. In ethics, we try to look only, and I know it's very difficult, and I know that there are a lot of gray zones, we only try to look at parts of the data protection legislation that relate to ethics. To give you an example, which is a major example, and we can discuss it for a long, long time, and most likely we'll be discussing it for a long, long time. In GDPR, there are five legal bases for processing personal data, one of which is informed consent. In ethics, informed consent is our holy grail, is a basic part 
of the way we considered, discussed, and design ethic processes until now. Maybe that discussion will change. We does not mean that a applicant cannot use any of the other legal basis for processing data. Of course they have to because they will have to be legal, but they better justify it properly in the ethics assessment in order for them to pass through the ethics review. Ethics, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Data protection is a big, heavy legislation, heavy in a good sense, because it promotes human rights and you should never forget that. It's the only major piece in legislation in the world that does that and does that for the moment effectively. And it can improve. And we should not try to mix what ethics does in privacy with what the legislation does uh, in, well, of course, in privacy. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'll let you continue with the presentation. All right, and let's go to the next slide. Um, there you go. Now, th this you have seen, you already see that uh, civilian focus and dual use is not there. We have an internal discussion about a misuse because the misuse item needs to be simplified further for the ethics part of the application. And you see a major addition, which is artificial intelligence. This is something that is part of the commission policy in addressing artificial intelligence issues. There will be a dedicated section in the self-assessment. There will be a dedicated set of questions specific to artificial intelligence in order to be able to address this issue from an ethics perspective. And there will be special flags on artificial intelligence that are included in the general part of the work program, i.e. the scientific part. We do not know from an ethics perspective how this will actually materialize in, uh, in, uh, in, in real terms. Uh, but we are getting ready, and part of the severe and complex issues will be also uh, dealing with the issue of artificial intelligence. And there we are going to be in a long and hopefully fruitful discussion with all of you in order to be able not to stop research on artificial intelligence. There is always that danger, very small danger. Uh, but at least to make sure that whatever our governments in the member states and the European Commission says that we should pay attention when we do artificial intelligence related research should be somehow followed in the different parts of our process, i.e. through the ethics part and through the uh, scientific part. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So, overall, no ethics issues, the proposal will be cleared. For ethics issues, the proposal will be flagged for ethics issues, which means that you will not get requirements, which become contractual obligations, for all the proposals that are in the low to medium risk category, which means that the host institutions are free if I'm allowed to say that, to implement the local ethics and national legislation on uh, the particular issues in, this, uh, in these applications. Our experts will look at all proposals anyway. They will just flag the low and medium and send the complex and serious to a full assessment that will be happening exactly as we are doing it uh, today. Next slide, please. So those are, if you like, the, the key uh, differences. All proposals are fully screened in Horizon Europe, as we did in Horizon 2020. They are expert driven. There is a flagging of issues, but no requirements in Horizon uh, Europe. The ethics assessment is a full panel process and, and full ethics review with uh, requirements that become contractual obligations. In uh, both categories, Horizon Europe, you can have an, an, an independent ethics advisor uh, or a board, 
And of course, an ethics check can be requested by us, by the ethics panels, or from uh, sometimes we all have requests also from beneficiaries to look at the ethics part of their proposal. Um, that's it. I think we um, covered this uh, until now. I'm not missing anything. No. Yes. Next slide, please. I just want to remind we have 10 minutes left. Yes, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, we have, I'm we have almost... A couple of, we have a couple of questions. Do you Excellent. want to take the questions now or...? Let me see. Uh, there is nothing here that is different. Let's go to the next slide really fast. Nothing here that is different from uh, current work. Next slide. Again, an overall uh, table. Uh, nothing... I mean, you've seen it, we've discussed it. Next one. Time to grant for all of you, time to grant. You know that sometimes they claim that ethics can delay the time to grant. So when our beneficiaries will receive their funding, it does not count. Now, as part of the new regulation, ethics is an exception. It does not count to time to grant. So if you are not ready for ethics, if you have sent a proposal that is not ethics ready, you will be delayed and you cannot complain. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know that researchers complain and they say, no, where it is, it's six months and I still have not seen my money. They cannot do that anymore. It's part of the regulation. Next, uh, security is two, I think. This is a schematic. Very good. Next. Help is on the way. Our you know, well-known help is on the way. Uh, the how to complete your self, self is, uh, your ethics self-assessment will be adopted. And the most important thing is the serious and complex uh, cases guide uh, will be available hopefully soon. Uh, the rest, I think uh, you have seen, there will be a guidance also on informed consent, which is extremely important. Uh, voila, I think the official part is over. Thank you. And we can go to the questions. Thank you, Dorian. Um, so, uh... I'll take this one first, although it appeared later in the discussion because it relates to what you said about artificial intelligence in the in the. Mm. Uh, uh, so you will have a special section dedicated to that. But so here's a question from Marion Skohawitz. Uh, uh, there's previous, pre previously been discussions about the code of artificial intelligence. Are there any news regarding this code and how it will be implemented in Horizon Europe? No, there is no uh, code that I'm aware of. There will be maybe a legislative initiative from the Commission at the, on artificial intelligence. For the moment, what we what we have is the guidelines from the high-level group on ethics in artificial intelligence that specify quite um, exhaustively the ethics issues that are raised in uh, artificial intelligence. Now, mind you, it's exactly what Lex was saying with the principles and the statements. They are higher level documents. They do not describe what responsibility is, right? In the high level group on artificial intelligence, they do not go into details of the how. They say that you have to do it. Our job is to translate those guidance to how, how a bench scientist does that in an appropriate way. Thanks. Which takes us to the uh... Maybe the final question, uh, which I saved a bit because it's quite general and quite big. So, but but um, you just touched on it a bit. So uh, it's a question from Diana. Uh, when you're in charge within a project to run the work package of ethics, what are you supposed to do? I mean, practical actions. So of course this is very big, but maybe some examples no. or general thoughts. Yeah, mm -hmm. not. Uh, um, you start from the zero point is you respond to the requirements that you have received in the ethics review reports. That's number one. You take requirement number one, provide ethics, I don't know, assessment for impact assessment. That is your responsibility. The ethics package responds to the requirements. If you design an ethics package before you go through the ethics review process, which is very normal and it becomes more and more uh, common, especially in complex and ethics issues, 
my advice, and this is only an advice because it's very difficult to know the specificities of each research project and each research work package within a project, is to reply to the how-to. If you have data protection, your ethics work package or your responsibility as an ethics advisor will be to take the questions in the how-to and address them. That is the easiest, straight easiest, yeah, straightforward way of addressing the issues in practical terms. And of course, if you are a project, sorry, and of course, if you are a project and there is an ethics issue that is raised during the uh, uh, during the work package, yeah, there you have to address it from, you know, when it comes up. Mm. Thanks, Jonas. I think this resonates very well with, with my and many other people's experience. I think with when researchers reply to a question regarding how to, and they just reply with a that. I mean, yes. <laughs> so you ask, how are you going to implement uh, this and this and that and, and in the project? And they uh, answer, we will implement this and this and that in uh, accordance with these and these guidelines. So I think it's, it's this is always the advice that we give to our researchers and it usually yeah. works out well because they, they can usually give a good reply. It's just yes. that they, as you were also touched upon earlier, they're, they're, they're short of time and they have limited resources in, in various ways. So they try to do it with as little work as possible, yeah. which yeah. Uh, is, is fine, of course, as long as you do enough, but, but uh, there's a minimal level, which is very good yeah. to, to, to emphasize explicitly yeah. here. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions. I just like to uh, go back very briefly uh, to, to um, um, uh, Katharina Miller's uh, question. And so what, what you said there was, was in reply, I mean, more education training, uh, yes. But in a question, Katharina explicitly mentioned researchers. But if I understood you correctly, you also emphasized the, the support structures at the, at the institutions, right? But that's extremely important. We cannot make the researchers into experts by educating them. But we must have more like a network where, of course, the experts in the institutions uh, with the division of labor and, of course, maybe education also for others than researchers to, to sort of reinforce these support structures. Uh, and that's, of course, something that we would be very happy to contribute to in this community. Uh, and, of course, with the help of different stakeholders, such as the Commission. Yeah. It, it requires really a very uh, systematic approach at the national level, and we all know how much pressure the universities have to do everything at the same time. But we all heard stories of how a data protection officer has been nominated. They were on vacation the day that they were looking for a data protection officer, or they were too late to step back. So, you know, if you have one person for a university with 50,000 students and a major portfolio in research, if that person is not well supported, obviously the work that they are going to do, to do is going to be challenging and problematic. Mm -hmm. So training is only part of the solution. I think the rector of Tilburg said it very clearly the, uh, other, uh, the other day in the uh, uh, Dutch network meeting, do not expect that uh, a training in statistics will make you into a statistician. Do not expect that two hours training in data protection will make you realize what data protection regulation is all about. It will give you a flavor. It will give you, it will open a window, just a small window. Mm. And researchers cannot do that all by themselves. No. Yeah, I was first struck by the, the appropriateness of that remark as well. This, this idea that what you do educate researchers to do, to do is um, uh, uh, help them realize when they need to ask for help. But that's it. An expert. Mm. That's it. Okay. We're out of time, I think. Perfectly timed again. Uh, Burana, you want to say something before the break? Thank uh, you, Dorian. One small, because this is extremely important, very fast. When you prepare a proposal, to have an ethics advisor means that you can pay them and the commission will accept this task, this budget. Do not pick up someone that is not related to your challenge. If you have a data protection problem, hire a data protection expert, even if they never read that is total in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you Dorian. Dorian. And Jonas, um, we are indeed out of time, but uh, if Lex is uh, still online, I would like to give you the opportunity to maybe 
provide a final remark, one minute about this morning and your reflection to both of you, Dorian and Lex. Oh, wow, this is an unexpected honor. Thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed myself. Uh, uh, not so much my own talk. Uh, I, I knew what I was saying already, but but I enjoyed Dorian's talk. It, it was very enlightening and I especially appreciate him to be open and clear, um, not make it more wonderful than it is. Uh, we're still putting this together in, on the European Union. But, but, but yes, on a world scale, you can see what is happening. Um, many people are complaining to the European approach, but I believe uh, we're doing rather wonderful things. And, and the GDPR, for instance, it's awful. I'm, I'm spending a few days a week in, in struggling uh, with, with methods to, to, to put together a code of conduct for Dutch researchers to make sense out of, of the mess. It is a mess, but, but it's a good mess. And in the heart of it, uh, it there, there are some very solid uh, procedures. And, and like Dorian said, I appreciate that, that you said it. It is not well understood by the experts behind the GDPR what research is all about. Uh, and, and, and we need to adapt it a little bit more to research. Uh, and that's possible within the frame which is available. There, there are um, exceptions possible. But what we see happen in my country and maybe also in many other countries is that the especially the, the legal persons in our institutes, they are so afraid to do something wrong that they're now forbidding everything, which is so stupid. Because like Dorian said, not, not that much changed. Um, and and it, the names are a little bit different. It's a little bit better regulated, but we can still do research the way we used to do research when we understand the system but especially the legal persons and the leadership of many research institutes, they have some difficulties and they, they, they are looking at these um, enormous fines they can get and decide to do nothing, to forbid everything. And, and that is what we need to repair together. And that's where your community comes in as well, I think. Yeah. So, so please take care of the Hong Kong principles. I, I, I've, I believe I made my points there, but, but also please take care of of the new rules from the EU, which are basically wonderful, but, but still a bit complex and not well understood everywhere. Dorian, from your side, anything uh, you'd like to add? Yes, uh, again, uh, both for ethics and research integrity, researchers, institutions, funders have to realize that now, in our time, what happens in the lab does not stay in the lab. They cannot keep anything under wraps. Everything becomes public as it should. So what we do and how we do it is an extremely important part of who we are as funders or researchers or institutions. We are trying from our side, but the commission has an administrative approach. Together, we have managed to push the training, the awareness with uh, the International Conference on Research Integrity. We are opening the discussion. We are opening the discussion with everybody around the world. So it's extremely important to keep doing that. There will be a lot of failures, but one success makes it worthwhile, including your data protection. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, super. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for your inspiring talks. I feel privileged to be working on, on this topic at the Yerma and uh, I look forward to continuing collaboration with you. I would also like to thank Stephanie and Jonas for uh, being there and moderating the sessions of this morning. Uh, Nick and Niall, uh, my dear colleagues who have been there all the time to support. And uh, last but not least, all of you who joined this morning, we had around 110 participants at some point uh, this morning. So um, this is over for this part of the meeting. Uh, some of you have registered for the discussion tables. You have received uh, information regarding how to join those tables by email, but also I put information in the chat. So for now, I will say goodbye to those of you uh, who might want to see you later and hopefully to see you soon for the next year, my event in March, but also in other occasions. Uh, maybe just a, a quick hi uh, from Jonas, Stephanie, Nick Nile. Maybe you could just say hi.
from your side by unmuting yourself and then we will gather in 10 minutes so if we could do a, a shorter break at 11:25 in the link that you find in the chat thank you and thank goodbye you. bye bye thank you keep up the good work bye. thank you bye bye, bye, -bye everyone bye -bye. thank bye -bye. you bye bye, bye, -bye.